Hello everyone and welcome to my channel this is the 30th part of what if Deku can't stop adopting kids hope you enjoy link to the original story and author in the description. Chapter 164, The Sports Festival Part 1 Once again Izuku had rented a bus for all of them to drive to UA on, much like he did when they went to the amusement park. Giza was driving it now, with Izuku in the seat directly behind them. Behind him was Sori who was the other bodyguard accompanying them. And behind her, were all the children that had gone with them. Fu and Kyosei, Kiba, Sanson, Shiroku, Yami, Mu, Netsu, Ken, Nara, aka, Alice, and the Cerberus trio. And behind the bus was a trailer, filled with their stuff. Mainly Kiba merch. I'm surprised you came with us Shiroku, I didn't think you were interested in hero stuff, Nara said. I'm not, but I do want to cheer on Achiko, Shiroku explained. Ari and Kay wanted to do it too, but they had to babysit the turtles, so I'm coming to represent them too. It's such a shame that you're not interested in being a hero. A.K.A. sighed from her seat. You could crush so many villains. I'm even more surprised that you came Mu, Netsa said, looking at Mu, who was covered in a sheet to keep people from looking at him. I wanted to see the heroes, Mu explained curtly. All right, everyone. Izuku spoke up getting everyone's attention. We're almost there. Now, remember, stay in groups. Always be near one of the bodyguards, and if something happens, let us know, immediately, understood? Yes. Shouted all the children. And remember, no using your quirks if you can help it. Izuku reminded them. This isn't the foundation, you can get in serious, serious trouble for using your quirks in public. Especially if someone winds up getting hurt. AKA raised her hand. What if some lower than dirt, scummy villain tries to do something? Izuku sighed. That depends. If you can, try to run away and get one of the bodyguards to deal with it. But if you for whatever reason, you or someone else is in danger and the only way to save them is to use your quirk, then do it. I'll handle the repercussions afterward. Got it? Everyone? Everyone nodded. And with that, the bus came to a stop. We have arrived, Giza said, putting the bus in park. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
They got a lot of looks from passers-by, not that any of them paid it any thought. Whoa look it's Kamui Woods. Netsa gasped, as he saw the rising star of a pro hero, along with Empty Lady in Death Arms. Dad can we go get his autograph? You can ask, but stay within sight, Izuku instructed. Immediately, the kids ran up to the heroes and swarmed them in the way children do. Izuku smiled as the children looked up at the heroes with glimmering eyes, it set his soul at ease. Yo! shouted a familiar voice. Ha! Huh? Izuku looked toward the sound of the voice and saw Fat Gum walking up to him. Fat Gum! Hey Midoriya, long time no see! Fat Gum greeted, as he came right up to Izuku. Glad to see you're healthy. Man to think that little kid I saw running a food stand would grow into this. Wild. Yeah, I can barely believe it myself. Izuku chuckled, as he recalled the last time he saw Fat Gum. It felt like so, so long ago. Back then, he only had two kids, was mildly wealthy, didn't technically have a job, and still lived in a small apartment. So much has happened, feels like I've lived two completely different lives. I can only imagine. Fat Gum said, before scowling. Hey, are you okay? No one around here is giving you any trouble because of your condition. Not yet. Izuku shook his head. Hopefully none of that will happen today, and me and the kids can just enjoy ourselves. Yeah, I heard about those meta liberation bastards. To think someone would go through all that trouble to attack someone just because they're quirkless, unbelievable. Fat Gum said in disgust. Makes no freaking sense. Izuku sighed. Unfortunately looking at history, this is very believable. Although I wish it wasn't. I'll tell you what, once we find where those quirkist lowlives are hiding, I'ma make sure I take him down myself, don't you worry kid. Fat Gum told him. You just keep doing your job, and taking care of those kids. Will do sir. Izuku smiled. And, thank you for being concerned about me. I can't say I'm thrilled about what happened to my middle school, but it was probably the right call. Glad you can see it, my way kid. Fat Gum said, patting him on the back. A father needs to stick up for himself if he wants good things for his kids after all. You're right about that. Izuku nodded. If I had let people walk all over me, I'd likely be dead by now. Bro! Yaba shouted as she and the others ran over to him after finishing up with Kemui Woods and company. She and the others proudly held up their autograph books, showing the three new signatures. Check it out Weewo is that fat gum? Cool. Sanson cooed. Dad you know fat gum? Netsu asked his fire almost sparkling. We've met, Izuku said, blushing a bit. He helped me out with something. It was my pleasure, your father's a stand-up guy after all. Can't let Quarkist keep him down for something so silly. Fat Gum said, giving them all a winning smile. Hey, why don't I give you all my autograph? Yeah ha. The kids cheered. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
wearing her Kiba shirt, Kiba hat, and Kiba jacket while taking a sip from her Kiba cup. Good thing I bought my stuff, early. I can't believe you spent half your paycheck on something you could have gotten for free. Fu thought to himself, as he used Kyosei to take money and hand out merch. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Will do, it was nice talking to you, auntie. Izuku smiled and waved as she left. See ya. Mitsuki waved back as she headed off towards where Bakugo went off to. After she was out of sight, Izuku looked back at the kids. So much has changed. But I wonder how much has stayed the same. With that thought tucked away for later, Izuku rejoined the kids and went to enjoy the rest of the pre-sports festival events. Chapter, Chapter 165, The Sports Festival Part 2 with the pre-sports festival events closing, the main event would soon begin. Izuku regrouped with the rest of his kids, and they arrived at their VIP spot. It was a special booth around the top of the arena covered with reinforced glass that would allow them to see the events of the festival just fine, but would also keep them safe. Kiba, are you okay? Izuku said, taking a close look at his third daughter. Yeah. Kiba groaned. My minions were a bit more enthusiastic than I thought. I'm just really tired. Fu, keep an eye on her, Izuku ordered. Fu nodded and helped Kiba up to her seat. All right everyone, take your seats, the race should begin in seconds, Izuku instructed everyone. Remember this glass is thick so you have to cheer extra loud if you want them to. Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
The mood was absolutely jubilant in the booth, as pretty much everyone celebrated the success of Azuku's closest friend. And Achiko just looked up at their booth and smiled before giving them a thumbs up. Izuku smiled back and returned the gesture. Kaboom! A sound so loud that it drowned out even the screams of thousands of people. The sounds of multiple explosions going off across the entire city. The ground shook as if a small earthquake was going off, and everyone went silent. Smoke could be seen rising in the distance, and those higher above could even see buildings collapsing in the distance. Shock washed over the now silent masses, as everyone stared up at the rising smoke with their mouths hanging open. Everyone please remain calm. Present Mike said after half a minute. It appears that something has happened outside of the arena. Do not panic, and remain in your seats. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The TV, the lights, everything turned off. Immediately, both girls started to panic. What's going on? Fuku had to fight to keep in her gas once again. It's just a blackout. Don't worry. Nothing's going to. And then a hand slipped itself over her mouth. Then her gas filled the room. Chapter 166, The Sports Festival Part 3 Izuku looked through the glass at the pure chaos unfolding outside. He noticed that whenever a starfish would land on someone's face, that person would seemingly go berserk, and start attacking everyone around the who didn't have a starfish on their face. This included even some of the pro heroes that happened to still be here. Such as Death Arms, who was currently smashing everything in sight, as people ran from him as fast as they could. Kamui Woods was both trying to restrain Death Arms with his branches and keep the starfish from falling on the people around him, by skewering them with his quirk, but it was clear he was being overwhelmed, thankfully it seemed like his helmet blocked the starfish from touching his face. And thankfully for them, the starfish couldn't get through the glass, instead just falling onto it with a plop, before sliding off. What the fuck? Yaba shouted in confusion and rage at the chaos in front of her. Blag! Kiba immediately started vomiting again, before passing out. Shit! Sori cursed as she rushed to Kiba's side. Lady K! Lady K! It looks like she passed out from stress and lack of blood. Giza deduced calmly. Fu, if you would please. Fu Im immediately ran over to Kiba and forced his arm on her fangs, which automatically began sucking up his blood. Throom! Suddenly the entire arena shook, as Starro landed in the center, on two of its legs. Starro turned around, causing the arena to shake with each step until it was looking right at them. Everyone's eyes widened with fear, as Starro winded back its right arm, and got ready to smash it into where Izuku and the others were hiding. Izuku was about to yell at everyone to get out when suddenly, someone grabbed Starro's massive arm before it could launch forward. I don't think so, Patrick. Empty Lady said, grabbing hold of Starro's arm, and flipping it over her should. Slam! Starro was slammed into the ground on its face, causing the arena to shake once again. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief. I'll have to give Empty Lady a personal thank you once this is all over. Empty Lady continued wailing on Starro, as the monster was unable to fight back. That was until suddenly a massive flock of birds started to swarm around her face. Ack! Get away from me you stupid Ack! From behind, a Siro who had a starfish on his face, attached a piece of tape to Empty Lady's back, allowing Sato who was also under the control of the starfish, to pull her down to the ground. Son of a bitch! Empty Lady cried as she tried to pull herself up, only for Jirota Shishida from Class B, also under Starro's control, to slam into her face in full beast form. Fuck! Shishida raised his claws, ready to tear out into Lady's eyes, only for Achiko to tackle him off of her, and onto the ground. Then, Vines grabbed onto the mind-controlled Siro and Sato, as Ibra from Class B threw them to the side and restrained them. Meanwhile, Momo and Jiro, both wearing helmets that Momo had made to keep from getting controlled by the starfish, were trying to guide the non-controlled civilians to the exits, shooting net guns at the mind-controlled civilians to restine them along the way. However, the moment they started to get close to an exit, all the exits were suddenly sealed shut by walls of cement, the work of a mind-controlled cementos. We need to help. Ken proclaimed immediately raising his omnitrix, only for Izuku to grab his wrist. Absolutely not. Izuku told them. It's too dangerous out there. But the civilians are being ripped apart. Nara argued, pointing out sides at the crowds of people who were being attacked by mind-controlled heroes, students, and civilians. If we don't do something people are going to die. Yes, but what happens if you go out there and get controlled? Izuku argued back. There are still starfish all over the place, if one of those gets on your face, do you know how much damage you could cause? That actually caused the children to hesitate. All of them were aware of how much damage their quirks could cause if used improperly, and they could only imagine what that monster would do with them. But what if someone else can't be taken over by it? She asked, getting everyone's attention. 
Sanson just doesn't have a face, so it'd be impossible for her to be controlled. If Ken turns into Heat Blast, then his face would be on fire, so he couldn't be controlled. Netsu is also on fire, and Mu hides in another dimension. I don't think those starfish things could get to them. That's right. Netsu gasped. We can go out and not get mind controlled. Izuku stayed silent as he battled with himself over what to do. Part of him didn't want to have his children go out and fight again. But the other part of him knew that they could help prevent casualties and even find a way out of here. However, however his train of thought was cut off when suddenly the door to the room was smashed open and ninjas armed with swords rushed in. Immediately, Sori and Giza rushed them before they could even get close to the children. The two of them moved at overwhelming speed, hitting the ninjas in their vital points and knocking them unconscious. In less than a minute, they'd knocked out all twenty assailants. Izuku scowled. I knew it. They were after us. I hear more on their way boss, Sori said. It would be best if we secured an escape route, Giza advised. While this place is safe from that starfish, it also leaves us trapped in a corner. And we will eventually be overrun if we do not leave. Damn it, Izuku swore, as he started coming up with a plan. Okay. Mu, have you used up any of your quirks time limit today? Mu shook his head under his cloth. Alright, then I want you to look for an escape route on your own, and if you find one, tell the group, and help them get out of there, Izuku explained. Giza, you do the same. Understood sir, Giza responded. Ken, Netsu, Sanson, come with me, we're going to help deal with the chaos outside, Izuku ordered, as he went to his other suitcase. Everyone else stay here, sorry keep anyone from getting inside, once more Giza comes back, then get out of there as quickly as possible. But avoid going outside where the starfish are. Uh, boss there are a lot of guys coming, sorry said. I'm not sure I can fight off all of them in such a small space. At least not while masking sure not to kill them. Maybe not normally, Izuku said, before opening the other suitcase, revealing some fractals and a chaos emerald. But with these, you just might. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
It'd be hard to explain she had just no idea why Fuku's quirk was affecting her the way that it did. So I'm fine. Oh thank goodness. Fuku sobbed, feeling like the weight of the world had fallen off her shoulders for a second, before remembering something. Wait. What about whoever grabbed me EAP? Fuku jumped over to Kira as she noticed the pile of robot parts behind her. Robots. It seems like someone sent robots to try and kidnap us, Kara said, stating the obvious. Are these ninja robots, Ni nee said. Cool. How did you know they were robots when you cut them up? Fuku asked her, causing Kara to flinch a bit. I heard the sounds of their robot parts. Nee's lied. Oh, that makes sense, Fuku said, immediately believing her. Wait why can she hear you and not me? Nis asked, waving her hands in front of Fuku's face. Fuku. Fuku, I'm right here. So, what do we do now? Fuku asked with a very concerned expression. What if everyone else is being attacked too? What do we do? There's no way Kyoku or Kate could fight against robots. Ah. You're right. But what can we do? Nis asked in distress. Neither of us can fight, and we can't open the door with no electricity. Kira had to resist the urge to roll her eyes. It's like she forgets how powerful our quirk is. Scree ee ee ee. Fuku went ridged at the sound of something scratching against her metal door. Scree ee ee. Scree ee. Scree ee. Bang. 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 More and more they heard things hit the metal door, and more and more the two girls started to get nervous. And then the door dented. Without waiting another second, Kira grabbed Fuku with one of her vectors, broke the window with another vector, and then launched, launched herself outside with the other two. Ah ha ha. Fuku screamed as the two of them started falling to the ground. Fortunately, she'd already used up all her gas, so her quirk didn't activate. Kira used her vectors to dig into the side of the house, slowing their fall until they could safely reach the bottom. Once they did, Kira immediately used her vectors to start running along the side of the house. Wait. Knees where are we going? Fuku asked in a panic, frantically looking around to see if they were gonna be attacked. Somewhere we can hide, Kira explained. The house isn't safe and without electricity, we can't get into the safe room. So all we can do is find somewhere outside and hide. But, the others. Fuku pointed out. I'm sure the bodyguards can handle it, Kira reassured her. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Help. Help us. Please. Tokoshi heard Eri cry, from one of the bedrooms nearby. Hold on Lady Eri. I'm coming. Tokoshi batted a few more robots out of the way and rushed toward the sound of Eri's voice. When he arrived, he found the door to the room had been smashed open, and inside were Eri, Kay, and the baby turtles, with a tiger man in front of them. Between them was a force field, seemingly being created by the fractal that Eri was holding. Smash! Smash! The tiger man smashed his fist into the barrier, making very small cracks with each hit. Sir, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave the premises, Tokoshi said, as he crushed the head of a robot with his hand for effect. The tiger man turned around and faced him, before cracking his knuckles. Make me. Chapter 167, The Sports Festival Part 4 Damn it! how did everything go to shit so fast? Aizawa asked as he and present Mike ran across the corridors of the arena, trying to get outside to help as quickly as possible to help his struggling students. Starfish. Seriously. Who sends a giant fucking starfish to attack you? Who does that? Mike lamented as they ran. I swear if that thing lays a tentacle on the kid Ilayishishich. Suddenly a big red hand burst out from under the floor and grabbed his foot, before dragging him to the lower floor. Mike. Aizawa went to go follow Mike down the hole, but before he could, he suddenly felt something hit him on his left, hard, sending him flying. Aga. Aizawa hit the ground and started rolling across the cement floor until he hit a wall. You're not going anywhere Eraserhead. Said a gruff voice. Ag. Aizawa stood up and looked at the source of the voice. There he saw two men. One was a very large dog man, covered in orange and white fur. His right arm was normal sized, but his left arm was massive. There was probably more mass in that one arm than there was in Aizawa's entire body. And next to him was a very uninterested and tired-looking man in purple pajamas and night shoes with amber hair. We can't let you get in the way of our plans. The tired-looking man said through a yawn. So you're gonna have to die here. Before Aizawa could activate his quirk, suddenly, the dog man was in front of him and punched him into the wall so hard it cracked. Ag. Aizawa spat out blood, before sliding to the floor, stunned by the blow, which likely broke a good amount of his ribs. Nighty night eraser head. The dog man smirked, as he raised up his massive arm, ready to deliver a devastating blow. P-S-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
None of those answers would have been, mind-controlling starfish would fall out of the sky and make her fight her classmates to the death. Achiko dodged Kirishima's attack and kicked him in the back, sending her mind-controlled friend flying. Before she could even catch her breath, she heard someone approaching her, and once she turned around, she saw that her next opponent would be a mind-controlled fat gum. Achiko rushed forward, dodging fat gum's punch, and then touching him, taking away his gravity, and throwing him helplessly into the sky. But while she doing that, it left her open for another attack. Quem. Ack. Achiko cried out in pain, as she got hit in the back by one of Aoyama's blast, distracting her enough for Ida to rush her, and kick her in the stomach, sending her flying onto her back. Ah. Gah. Achiko tried to pull herself up, only for one of Pony's horns to fly down and stab her in the leg, pinning her down. Ah. Without missing a beat, a mind-controlled shoji, extended one of his arms towards Achiko, with a starfish in his hand, ready to add them to their forces. Kaboom! Until Bakugo swooped in, and hit Shoji with an explosion, knocking him away from Achiko. What the hell are you doing round face? Bakugo snapped, as he landed on the battleground. Get the hell up! The last thing we need is you going berserk on top of all this. Ack, not like I was trying to get mind controlled. Achiko spat, as she pulled the horn out of her leg. She tried to stand up, and nearly fell back down again from the overwhelming pain. Crap. She might have hit bone. Speaking of pony, she sent a barrage of horns at Achiko, who had no chance of dodging with her injured leg. Fortunately, she didn't have to, as a wall of ice came between her and the horns, blocking them from hitting her. We're going to get overwhelmed, Shoto said as he rushed to Achiko's side, using his fire to clean her wound, and his ice to patch it up. This isn't going to end until we take out that big starfish. Haya empty lady cried as gave Starro another punch to the eye. re e e e Starro cried, before using one of its arms, to grab onto empty lady's arm. Fuck. Let go you, gross bastard. Empty lady tried to pull her arm away, but Starro's suction cups kept her in its grasp. Well someone needs to help him and tits over there because she ain't doing much on her own. Bakugo shouted as he exploded away a group of students. Fwoosh. Suddenly a jet of flames came down from above and burnt off the arm that was touching him to lady. Ah uh, yeah. Time to feel the burn. Netsu shouted as he descended down near MT lady's head. A kid? MT lady looked at Netsu in confusion. She had half the mind to tell him to fly off, given that he was a kid after all. However, seeing as the situation was rather dire, she decided to just go with it. Whatever, I don't care anymore. Kid blow a hole in that thing I will personally take care of whatever fine you get. Neat, neat. Netsa's face broke into a wicked grin, as he started charging his quirk. Time to send you to heck Starface. As heat built up around Netsu, Starro took notice and knew it had to take action. Take this. Inferno Cannon. Netsu unleashed a massive blast of fire right at Starro's eye, intent on blowing a hole right through the middle of it. Fwoosh. But the blast never hit its target, as a mind-controlled cementos put up a thick wall of cement between Starro and the attack. Damn it. MT Lady cursed as she looked at the partially melted wall. Poom. Ah. Suddenly one of Aoyama's charged shots blasted Netsu out of the air, causing him to start falling to the ground. Shit. MT Lady swore as she put her hand under Netsu, catching him before he could fall very far, and burning her hand each second she held him. Ow, 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 crap. Bang. 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 Ag. MT Lady was suddenly shot in the eyes by a mind-controlled snipe, who started unloading his clip into her face. Ow. Shit. Cut that out. MT Lady covered her face with her other hand to block the attacks, but the attacks didn't let up, death arms threw chunks of the arena at her, Koda sent birds to peck at her face, Shota from Class B used his quirk to throw things at her, and Juzo softened the ground under her, causing her to start sinking. We need to get the focus off MT Lady. 
Achiko said as she dodged attacks from Kirishima and Tetsutisu. Easier said than done round face. Bakugo shouted as he blew away Sato, only for Ida to charge in and kick him in the stomach. Ack! Damn it glasses! We're getting pushed back. Todoroki pointed out as Kendo and Shishida broke through his ice. There's too many of them. Achiko looked at the waves of her classmates surrounding them, not to mention all the innocent people under the villain's control. Meanwhile, Emma Lady was being barraged with attacks while hiding Netsu in her hand, if he even tried to exit her palm, then he'd also get bombarded with attacks. Something, something had to give, otherwise, they'd be done for. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
However, one of them managed to report something a second before he was taken out. Something about an invisible monster. Invisible monster, we don't have any reports of the Midoriya Foundation owning something like that. Karai mused. Either way, our main priority is that rat and the death of Midoriya Izuku. I'm sending more men now. I'll also be sending IT to take care of that monster. Very well. Shinigami was about to ask how things were going over at the Midoriya Foundation grounds when she felt a presence approaching. I apologize, there is someone I have to take care of. As Shinigami ended her transmission, she heard someone land behind her and immediately threw a kunai at them. Boing! The kunai bounced off of thin air, and the gentle criminal was unharmed, as he glared fiercely at his opponent. I suppose you must be the reason why no heroes have noticed this commotion yet, Gentle said. And what if I am? Shinigami asked. Boing! Gentle wasted no another word and immediately made the air behind his elastic, before bouncing off of it and heading towards Shinigami at alarming speeds. Shinigami readied herself for his frontal attack, but just as Gentle was in front of her, with a bit of maneuvering and use of his quirk, he rebounded, over and behind her, before kicking her in the back, into some elastic air, bouncing her back towards him, where he then kicked her to the side, sending her rolling across the floor. As she rolled, Shinigami got to her feet and slid to a stop. Not half bad, it seems you're more skilled than expected, gentle criminal. Although I could have sworn you said you didn't like violence? I don't, I don't, gentle said, with a dark look on his face that would make most people shiver. However, one of your starfish landed on the face of my dear La Brava, and now she has lost control of herself. If the only way to get her back is to put an end to this farce, then so be it. I will not show you a shred of mercy. Fighting for love, how touching. Shinigami mocked, as she got into a fighting stance. Unfortunately, this isn't a fairy tale, so the power of love won't save you. I'll be ending your life, here and now. Chapter 168, The Sports Festival Part 5 Tiger Claw had been confident going into this. He'd never failed a mission before and had no intention of starting now. Regardless of how strong his enemy was or how well guarded they were he'd always prevailed through some method. But the Midoriya Foundation was another beast entirely. The moment he got here through one of Kirojiri's portals, he was immediately confronted with two giant apes and a giant vent snake. They weren't very tough, but it was bizarre. Then, when he found the turtles he was tasked with getting back, guarded only by two little girls, he thought this would be easy. Now he was aware of both their quirks, but he'd already planned ways to deal with them if he had to. Namely his gun. But what he wasn't prepared for, was for the white-haired girl to pull out a crystal, and put up a force field. Because who would expect that? Who would prepare for that? But he didn't have much time to figure out a way around it, as one of the butlers came in to fight him. Now normally that wouldn't be a problem, except this guy was just fucking invincible apparently. Tiger Claw let loose in a flurry of blows, at all of Tokoshi's vital points. But if they bothered Tokoshi at all, he didn't show it. As the man simply looked down at his opponent, unimpressed. Tokoshi then raised his hand, and backhanded Tiger Claw on the side of the face, sending him flying through several walls until he ended up outside, and fell into the grass and dirt below. Ugh, ugh. Tiger Claw landed on his back and shook his head to get rid of the pain and dizziness. Damn, that old man is far stronger than he looks. And my attacks can't even make him flinch. As he got up, he heard something step on the grass behind him, close, about two feet away. Tiger Claw immediately roundhouse kicked whatever it was behind him, hitting something and knocking it back. The hound became visible, and its claws dug into the ground, stopping itself before it could go very far away from its target. It opened its mouth and let out a stream of fire heading right toward Tiger Claw. In response, Tiger Claw jumped to the side of the house and dodged the attack before running across the wall, getting closer to the hound and then leaping at it, claws first. Tiger Claw pounced onto the hound grabbing it by its shoulders and biting into its neck, destroying most of it, but this was not nearly enough to stop the hound. The hound grew bone around that area in its neck, locking Tiger Claw's fangs in its throat, before growing a pair of wings. 
Tiger Claw's eyes went wide, and he quickly realized how dangerous the situation just became, as he and the hound lifted into the air. He dug his claws into the bone around his teeth, trying to tear away at it to free himself, but everything time he scratched it, it rapidly regenerated. Eventually, he managed to kind of wiggle his teeth out of the hound's neck, but just as he freed himself, the hound started glowing. Kaboom! XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The mind-controlled students looked over, and they were suddenly shot, the bullets getting lodged into the starfish on their fa faces, which promptly fell off. Ha! Huh? The now freed students sported confused looks, as they didn't know how they got here or what just happened. What? The three students in the dome looked at the freed students in shock before Achiko rushed out of the dome. When she got out, she was Izuko standing on top of the dome, shooting down at the starfish on the students' faces, while some of the now freed students and heroes such as Mineta, Ibra, Death Arms, Cementos, and Kaminari kept him safe. Izuku! Achiko shouted in surprise. Out of all the people she expected to come to save them, Izuku was not one of them, maybe one of his kids, but not the green-haired teen himself. Nor did she expect him to be wielding a gun. Achiko! Izuko gave the girl a look of relief and slid down the dome to meet her. I'm so glad you're not mind-controlled. Wait, what happened to your leg? I got stabbed, but I'll be fine, Achiko reassured him with a forced smile, but Izuku was having none of it. Izuku then pulled a fractal from his sleeve and offered it to Achiko. Take this, and try using it like an extension of your quirk. Achiko was confused but didn't question it, and quickly grabbed onto the crystal before doing as instructed. Suddenly, the fractal started to glow white, and that white glow spread over Achiko's body. Her wounds started to close up, and she could feel the pain and fatigue quickly fade away until she was fully healed and rejuvenated in only a few seconds. Ha! Huh? Achiko looked over her body in disbelief. What the heck was that? It's a long story, for now just focus on the fight. Izuku told her. Get that crystal to Kaken and Todoroki then Ak. Suddenly he was shot in the side of the head by Snipe. Fortunately, his cloak stopped most of the damage, but Izuku was knocked down to the ground. Ah, someone needs to deal with Snipe. Izuku ordered. Is there any anyone who can take care of him? I'll get him. Tetsu Tetsu shouted. Someone give me a boost. On it. Sato picked him up and threw Tetsu Tetsu toward Snipe as hard as he could, sending him flying toward the mind-controlled hero. The mind-controlled Snipe tried to shoot Tetsu Tetsu out of the air, but the boy's metal body blocked every attack, and he collided with Snipe, tackling him into the wall and holding him there. All right. Netsu. The sky is clear. Izuku shouted. Yeah. Netsu shouted as he jumped out of him to Lady's hand, and soared into the air. Time for some fried starfish. Netsu started charging up his quirk, ready to unleash a massive attack at Starro. Starro once again knew he was in trouble, but he didn't have any minions left that could stop this. So it did the only thing it could. Starro stretched out one of its arms, touching part of the arena, before lifting it up with its suction cup, and smashing it into a Lady's face. Ah. Until Lady fell as the piece smashed against her face, and then Starro jumped on top of her, pinning her to the ground. Ah! Get off you stupid! Netsu looked down with wide eyes, and stopped his charging, knowing now if he tried to blow a hole through Starro, and Lady would get caught in the blast. Uh oh! Guys I can't fire! Damn it! Death Arms shouted, we need to get that thing off him to Lady. Of course, that was easier said than done. No one had the power to lift something so massive off of her, and any attack that could significantly harm it would hit her as well. No, it's too risky. Izuku shouted as he shot another starfish off someone. I have another plan, we just need to hold off the people until it's done. Everyone, get ready. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I've got a situation, I can't beat my opponent without my quirk. But I can't fight him and keep up the illusion at the same time. I'll hold out for as long as I can, but we need to hurry. Curses. Karai swore. This whole operation is going right to hell. What the hell is taking that damn mutant so long to get to those kids? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
M.T. Lady shouted as she tossed the weightless Starro into the air, leaving it completely defenseless. Finally! Netsu yelled as he rapidly charged up his quirk, using every bit of power he had, to finally put an end to this thing. Netsu's fire turned white, as he aimed his hands up at Starro. White! Hot! Hell! Boom! A wave of white-hot fire shot out of Netsu's hands, with a deafening roar, in the form of a huge burning beam. The last thing Starro ever saw, was white, as the beam pierced through its center like a bullet through paper. Netsa's beam pierced the sky, putting an end to the star-shaped threat. Release! Achiko quickly deactivated her quirk, allowing the corpse to crash into the earth. She quickly deactivated her quirk, and collapsed from the pain, drifting off into unconsciousness. Ho ho! Yeah! All the remaining fighters cheered, celebrating, celebrating their victory, as all the mind-controlled people, came to a stop. And then they started going berserk. Suddenly every mind-controlled person started wildly flailing about, hitting anything around them, including themselves, and using their quirks wildly. The fighters looked at the chaos with wide, disbelieving eyes. No, I thought taking out the main one would kill them all, but it was just keeping them in control. Izuku shouted out in horror. Everyone. We need to restrain as many people as possible. Got it, boss. Shouted Sori's voice from out of sight. Slam. 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 Suddenly, every mind-controlled person was stuck in quick succession, knocked unconscious in mere seconds. Once again, everyone looked up in disbelief, as Sori appeared in front of Izuku, holding the Chaos Emerald. Done. What the fuck? Bakugo said simply. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
She'd been using this quirk to make it appear to the people outside that the arena wasn't under attack, but now there wasn't really a point. She made herself completely invisible while leaving a fake doppelganger to trick Gentle. Shinigami attempted to run off the side of the arena, to jump down and make her way to Wazuku, however, as she jumped off, Giza flew up and kicked her in the jaw, knocking her back up, onto the top of the arena, and breaking her illusion. Gah! Shinigami slid back, as Giza landed on the top of the arena. You! So you finally show yourself! Given you were about to assassinate my benefactor, it would be inconsiderate for me not to show myself, Giza said, as he put his hands behind his back and took a relaxed stance, before looking to gentle. I must thank you for keeping her occupied, otherwise I may not have been able to stop her before she moved location. No, no. If anything you have my apologies, a gentleman should finish his own business in a timely manner. Something which I have failed to do. Gentle gave him a polite bow. If I may, I'd like to ask you for your assistance in punishing this woman, for harming my dear La Brava. Gladly, catch. Giza swiveled around and kicked the air, hitting a cloaked Shinigami and sending her flying toward Gentle. Gentle made the air in front of him elastic, which Shinigami bounced off of back towards Giza. Shinigami took out her shorts and slashed at Giza as she flew towards him, but he caught her hand stopping her slash and threw her around and into the ground, before kicking her in the specific part of the arm, forcing her to release the blade. Shit. I need to get away. Shinigami activated her quirk and made it appear that more foot ninjas had run up the wall and come to attack Giza who was keeping her pinned. Gentle was about to rush over to help, but Giza gave him a look that told him to stop. The illusionary soldiers struck at Giza, but of course, they did nothing but pass through him. Your illusions will not work on me, Giza told her. Your plan ends here. Stump. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Izuku sat behind his desk in his office, with Chol and Sai beside him. And in front of him, was none other than the Prime Minister of Japan, Purameo. She looked rather good for a woman at the age of 75, with only a few wrinkles on her face, and she wasn't super thin under her suit, but her age showed in her gray hair and her squinting eyes behind her glasses. Hello, Miss Prime Minister. Izuku greeted with a bow. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Yes, yes. Pura said dismissively. Mr. Midoriya, I don't believe I need to tell you why I'm here correct. Izuku sighed. You're here about the reports you got on my fractal and chaos emerald. A woman with speed that rivaled all might holding a bright gem. And a crystal that would heal anyone who touched it, as if it were giving them a healing quirk. I can't imagine the government wouldn't be interested in that. Although, I didn't think the prime minister herself would be coming to greet me. I've already looked into what we know about fractals and the emerald, Para told him. And fired the people who dismissed Ms. Jicken when she stumbled upon the discovery of the century and failed to report this to me. But I'd now I'd like to ask you, what exactly have you been doing with that lab Mr. Midoriya? A lot, and not enough, Izuku explained. We found out so much about chaos energy, that's what we're calling energy by the way, and yet there is still so much to be found, and so much to do. Its potential is nearly endless, and once we can find a way to produce it without relying on Mu, it'll be an absolute game changer. The fractals are just fractions of their potential. Soon chaos energy will run the world. And sin since you control it, so will you. Pura deduced. To think this opportunity could have been ours. But nonetheless, I trust you know what needs to happen next. You want access to my research, as well as the things made from it, Izuku said. But unfortunately for you, you lack the power to simply take them, as they are all private property. Given your recent unapproved use of them in public, it could be argued, we have the right to confiscate them, Pura argued slash threatened. Incorrect. The Chaos Emerald is not, by definition, a weapon. Neither is a healing fractal. Nor are they quirks, so there are no laws against being able to use them in public. Izuku retorted. But according to what little we have of Ms. Jicken's notes, quirks and fractals operate of the same energy and do very similar things. So it could be argued that they are an illegal use of quirks. Pura contended. Not to mention the definite use of the quirks by your children during the attack. If you recall, M.T. Lady said that she gave permission for my children to use their quirks. Izuku reminded her. And we have several witnesses backing this up. Heroes can only give permission for people to use their quirks in such a manner if those people are hero students. Pura corrected. Which your children are not. Incorrect, heroes can give permission for normal people to use their quirks in dire situations, Izuku added. Of course, whether or not the situation was dire and if the given permission was necessary will be later judged by the Hero Public Safety Commission, but I think myself and the public can agree, there is no way that situation couldn't be considered dire. Those permissions still do not allow the use of quirks to harm others, Pura said. Other people. Netsu only hurt that starfish and there is no proof of any of my children having harmed a person during the attack. Izuku told her, getting frustrated at this point. Look, you have nothing significant to use against me. So here's what we, we can do, we can either work together and come upon an agreement that benefits us both, or you can keep trying to get one over on me and make me angry. And I assure you, that won't do you much good. Pura glared at Izuku. TCH. Fine, what is it that you want? Izuku smiled. Thank you. Now, as for what I want. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
John, as opposed to everything, didn't seem too concerned. He was still taking everything seriously, but he was far more relaxed. That's right. Izuku nodded, before taking a brief pause. Now, before this, I was willing to just do everything I could, to keep my family safe, but this has shown me, that that is not enough. They won't let us be. They will take every opportunity to attack us, no matter who gets hurt. And they will make our lives, miserable, so long as my enemies remain free, my children won't be able to leave the grounds of the foundation, without risk of something like this happening. This is unacceptable. This cannot be allowed. And so, I can't stop, stop at just defending us anymore. I need to attack. I need to crush my enemies if I want my children to be safe. And so that's exactly, what we're going to do. It was then, that Izuku took two things out of his pocket, a quirk erasing bullet, and a vial of blood. The best way to defeat your enemies, and defend yourself, is to amass power. Izuku continued, putting the bullet down on the table, and lifting up the vial. What I have here, is power. Unrefined, absolute, power. This is Eri's blood. As you all know, Eri's quirk allows her to return things to a previous state. In whatever way that entails. She could erase your memories, heal your wounds, turn into a child, and erase you entirely. And even revert a person back to an evolutionary state, before humans developed quirks. Which is why her blood is a key ingredient to making this quirk erasing formula, it's also the key to our plans. Sir, do you want to, mass produces this formula? My asked, looking very unsure of this concept. Not quite. Izuku shook his head. While I would like to have some quirk erasing bullets on hand, the quirk erasing formula is not a key part of my plan. And what exactly, is this plan sir? Dr. Hikari asked. Izuku took a deep breath and got ready to explain. First, we need to find a way to replicate the effects of Ares' blood, without actually having to use Ares' blood. This will make Ares' life significantly easier, and allow us to move on to step 2, using that to create a drug that can cure nearly anything. Everyone's eyes went wide at what Izuku just suggested, as the implications of what such a drug could do and the effect it could have on the world would be enormous. I'm not a scientist, but this should be possible, correct? Izuku asked them before he continued. If all quirks come from chaos energy, and if we can produce a way to create chaos energy, then we should be able to create the effects of her blo blood, and that should allow us to create the cure-all. Right. The room went silent, as everyone started to calculate the plausibility of this in their heads. Well, we have developed a blueprint for something that can produce chaos energy, so if we can find a way to turn that pure chaos energy, into something like Ares' unique chaos energy, then we should be able to create something that could replace her blood as an ingredient, Mai explained. And if we can do that, then in theory we could create this cure-all. So it's possible? Izuku asked them. As far as we know, John spoke up. There's still a lot of big ifs in the picture, but it doesn't sound impossible. But if it is possible, we're talking about something that could change the world as we know it. Achi pointed up. Yeah, the entire drug and medical world would be turned on its head. And who knows how many businesses would go bankrupt. Futaba pointed out. And even more people lose their jobs. Izuku nodded solemnly. I know, and I have a plan for that too. It's not perfect, but it's the best I can think of at the moment. At the very least it will save millions if not billions of lives. That is true, but that does worsen the problem of overpopulation. Dr. Hikari brought up. Not that I'm in any way opposed to saving all those people, it's just, that's another issue we'll have to worry about. Not to mention, how, exact, how exactly are we going to distribute this drug across the world? As much as I would love to simply give it away, at the end of the day we at least need enough money for this project to sustain itself. And if we charge for it, then there's no guarantee that everyone who needs it will get it. Not much I can do about that, but either way, we're going through with this, Izuku said. So, after we produce this drug, obviously we won't have to worry about money anytime soon, not to mention this also allows me to gain favor with the public, which opens up plenty of doors for us. And as for all the people who will end up employed, 
well the only solution for that is to hire them myself. Some of them will be responsible for mass producing the drug, but most of them will go into my other big project. Involving Project Seed If we can produce chaos energy reliably, then we can grow products that are unlike anything else. And do things unlike anyone else. What those things are will depend on what we can grow, but no matter what happens, I don't think I need to tell you just how much we can make with this. Combing this with the drug, you could be the richest man on the planet. Futaba whistled. Boss, what are you planning to do with all this money and power? A few things. Firstly, as Dr. Hikari pointed out, not everyone will get access to this drug. Particularly places without free healthcare, like America. Izuku's expression shifted into that of disgust for a moment. And much as hate it, I can take advantage of that. While I can't give the drug out to everyone that needs it, I can give it to a few useful individuals. People who will be extremely grateful for my help. Everyone, everyone looked a bit uneasy at that. Well, it's not like we can fix that problem either way, so might as well take advantage of it I guess. John shrugged. That's just the way it is, some people will always be unlucky. You got that right, Fataba said, looking rather dismayed. All right, now that I've told you the plan, here is what we're going to do, Izuku said, sifting to his final point. First things first, we have to focus on creating chaos energy. Once we do that, I want your focus to be on creating that blood substitute and finding out if the cure-all is plausible. But don't start development of it until I tell you to. Once I have confirmation, I'm going to ask various other parties to pitch in on funding this research. With something like this, people will be tripping over themselves to have their names attached to this. The good PR they'll get will offset any money they may have actually put into the project. So not only will I get to save some money, they'll be in my debt. Ha, huh, that's actually pretty clever. My pointed out. Bara, keep focusing on Project Seed, I want you to experiment with as many different kinds of plants as possible, Izuku told Uchi before looking over to Futaba. Akira, I heard you were experimenting with making portals into other dimensions. Um, kinda? It's mostly making a portal into the cognitive world. Futaba explained. I see, do you think that sort of research could help us learn more about portals and warp quirks in general, and maybe how to stop them? Izuku asked. Well that's not really my area of expertise, but probably, Futaba answered with a shrug. To be honest, I'm kinda stumped on certain parts of the project, maybe we could bring in someone who specializes in wormholes or something. Noted. Izuku nodded. I want to find some way to stop villains from warping into the facility. That's gonna, that's gonna be a tough one, Futaba muttered. I would also like to drastically increase the personnel working around here, Izuku said. As of now, we have far too many scientists working on our various projects, forcing us to pick and choose a select few projects to work on at a time. It limits us by quite a bit. Find people you can trust, in any way you can. It was then that everyone started to consider how to do this. Colleges, students, old friends, there were a few options if they went out of their way. Another thing, I need you to find a way to extend the range in which Yami can absorb negative emotions, Izuku asked. Since he can't go outside, he can't absorb as much energy, this is a big issue for obvious reasons. So you want us to create some kind of emotion vacuum or amplifier? Futaba mused. Yeah, we're definitely going to need to increase our work staff for all this. I'm sorry for asking so much of you, Izuku said. But it's all necessary to protect the future of my kids. We understand sir, and it's the least we can do for all you've done for us, my reassured him. We will do our best, sir. One last thing, and again I'm sorry for asking a lot. Izuku then reached into his sleeve and pulled out a jar, containing one of the starfish from back at the arena. I'd like you to analyze this. Isn't that one of the things that attacked the sports festival? John asked. Is it okay for you to have that? It is now, Izuku told them, before taking out his phone to look at the time. Oh, sorry, I have to be somewhere to be soon. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
so then, everything is in place. Nizu and Izuku were currently in the private room of a very high-class restaurant, enjoying some steaks and salads. Once everything is finished, I'll have the power to do whatever I want, Izuku said, not liking how sinister that sounded. And enough money to buy a country. Good, good, good. I always knew you had incredible potential Mr. Midoriya. Nizu praised. Combine that with your peculiar luck and you have something truly special. So long as the right people help out along the way. Now, let's celebrate our plan to destroy the foot, the MLA, and the League of Villains. Izuka gave his food a sad, longing look and sighed. I don't get it. Why does nothing ever go the way I want, when all I want to do is help people? I wanted to be a hero, and I ended up quirkless. I want to quietly raise children and mind my own business, suddenly powerful organizations are coming out of the woodwork to try and kill me. I just... The green teen looked at his reflection in his glass. Aunt Mitsuki was wrong. I have changed a lot. I don't think I've ever felt this angry before. He shook his head. Sorry, I'm just dash. It's okay to be dissatisfied, Nizu assured him. Being cruel is not in your nature. Unfortunately, if you want to do anything of note in this world, good or bad, cruelty is required. Izuku looked deeper into his reflection, noting the malicious look in his eyes. I know. Don't worry, I won't let it stop me. Anything that tries to ruin my children's future must be destroyed. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX